Hey, it's Joe Solari, and this is the business of writing. And today we have an interesting guest. Uh, we're going to be talking with one of the bigger names in audiobooks, Luke Daniels. Luke is an actor, writer, director, and I think spends most of his time. I don't know how you have any time to do anything else, but audiobook narrate now. <laughs> um, you've yeah. done over 600 audiobooks. Um, you've been a recipient of 13 audiophile earphone awards, few nominations for Audis. I think you've got a few that haven't been announced yet, from what I know. Um, and you have a background in classical theater and film. Welcome, Luke. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I appreciate it. I'm excited to get to talk uh, audiobooks and authors and all sorts of stuff. That's my bailiwick. So thanks for having me on. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is really an interesting intersection in the creative world where um, folks like you and authors, um, you know, 10 years ago, probably none of this could have ever happened. And now there's this moment in time where there's going to be this just massive creation of iconic um, uh, uh, culture and you guys are going to make a bunch of money. So what could be bad about that? Right? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Making money is always good. And it's yeah. uh, <clears throat> telling stories is even better. So if there's a way to marry both of those, then uh, I'm all in for sure. Cool. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about like <clears throat> how you got to this point where you're one of the most um, sought after voices in audiobooks. I was uh, late one night. I was down at the crossroads and uh, <laughs> a man with a tall black cat came and said, uh, we can make a deal. And I was like, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> I, <clears throat> I grew up in an acting family, uh, people who were, uh, performed in theater and my, both of my parents were uh, teachers of uh, theater and directors. And so I grew up around storytelling and that being a way to, you know, make a living as well. So I, those were my first influences and they were really good influences. And I was lucky to have that as a base. And then I went to school for performance. I got my MFA from University of Connecticut's um, performance program, which was a, a great three-year experience where we did a ton of voice and dialect and acting work that kind of created the toolbox. And then I started, the first company I started working with was called, uh, they're called Brilliance uh, and they're owned by Amazon, but they've been around, it's funny you say 10 years. I've started about 12 years ago is when I started <clears throat> and the uh, business was all mostly, not all, but uh, mostly in studios, professional large studios, mm -hmm. maybe three or four different uh, places. And that was like what brilliance was. So I was lucky to get to work there for several years and learn from, we had things like directors and engineers and us. And as I'm sure you know, things have shifted into the, the home recording setup as being the, the main way that people produce audiobooks. Um, and so now you do it all on your own. But I was lucky for those first few years that I was cutting my teeth. I got to work with other narrators who would direct or they would take a chance. You know what I mean? So I, I or I directed a lot, too. Um, so I got to listen and work on that side. So I got to see a bigger picture. Um, I think it would have been much harder to start out, uh, which would be now most people starting out are in a place like this or mm -hmm. something not not as nice. And they're trying to cut their teeth at this, but um, having other people to learn from was really helpful. And so that's how I got my start. And then I noticed the trend uh, that things were going to shift towards um, home studios. So I got this going. And uh, now I pretty much, I mean, obviously with um, COVID, I've done exclusively from home, but in the, you know, I tend to do everything from home. And then a couple times a year, I'll travel to uh, random house in New York or something like that, just to get back to a, um, a professional studio, just to break it up. Cause it's hard being on your own the whole time. I'm sure with authors, it's the same thing. You're that's why you see these writing groups and stuff like that to kind of help. It's such a isolating career choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's about filling that bucket back up, but that long story short, that's kind of how I started out. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really <laughs> important point you made. I think, if you're if the, if the audiobook narration business is like an author business, working from home is a you know it's a blessing and a curse, right? Because it's like your work is always there. <laughs> you could always put in a few more hours, uh -huh, and uh -huh. um, you know I've got an enormous respect for what it takes to narrate a book because of you know you have to take care of your vocal cords and 
you have to be on, you have, you know, in your case, I've, you know, I've listened to your work and, you know, it's not like you're just reciting the words, you're, you're working characters and you're changing your tones and all that stuff that can be a little tough on your, your voice. Um, and just like authors, like they sit for 12 hours at a keyboard and then they wonder why they get carpal tunnel. <laughs> right. Or have the, the bad posture. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's an unforgiving and I think it's similar to as long as we're talking about the similarities between authordom and narrating them, um, it, it, it's that singular focus that's so difficult to maintain. So if you're writing, you're trying to create this world off a blank canvas and you have to have incredible focus and dr drive to continue that, that kind of creative action that is all internal. And I feel like that's similar to the narrating process, except we have it easier because you already get the authors already gave us the words. So mm -hmm. I figure it's it's still a little easier on the narrating end because I've got a script and everything I need is in that script. So um, it takes a lot of the pressure off. I have a, a very clear guidebook. But yeah, it's a it's that focus. And the other thing I find difficult is <clears throat> um, everything is linear. So in a story, everything is leading. Each word leads into the next word that leads into the sentence that makes the paragraph, that makes the chapter, that makes the story, right? Mm -hmm. Light, real life is not linear. So <laughs> when I work, my thought process is so very driven of like, get to this sentence and then you structure, you know what I mean? Everything builds on itself. Mm -hmm. And then I come out of the booth and there's real life where it's all just like this and it's all messy and chaotic. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. I got to switch and take this hat off and put my crazy chaos hat back on to deal with reality so it is a shift to go back and forth like that so yeah well that's to... yeah and i you know so i know a lot of authors that you know when they go into the writing cave and they're really deep into story it's you know it's an escape from reality right like it, it what they figured out is like right. <laughs> it goes back to those days when they were daydreaming in school and their teacher's like what are you you know what are you doing well right Right. You're not going to make any book or whatever. Yeah. And now you turn that yeah. into a way to actually make money from your daydreams. Um, a lot of, a lot of authors, they, they do enjoy that time. And like you say, then you come out and it's like all the, the tough stuff, right? It's I got to market right. this stuff and I got to, right. Um, you got to figure out how this says, My ahead. wife always says that she wants a, a sound booth of her own because I can just escape in here and the craziness <laughs> continues out there. But I get to be in here, so right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And she's got to book stuff and be figuring out your schedule. And oh all. man, I could not do it without her. She does everything for the business. All I do is read the read the books, and so it's it's really valuable to have help. I think that's so hard. And when people are starting out, there's no way to have that. You know, you can't afford to to pay somebody or or whatever. So you're doing it all yourself, and you have to wear so many different hats to you know, uh, authors, just like narrators, we are our product. So um, authors have the product of their actual stories and we have the product of our narration, but uh, we ourselves are part of that package. So you'd have to kind of market yourself that way. Yeah. So were you a reader before you got into this or did the like reading piece come into like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I got to start. Yeah, no, I was really lucky because again, I was raised with, um, good folks that had uh we had our whole basement was filled with books they love they read consistently they're those type of people that read everything so i grew up around books and i did read a lot and then i transitioned to a lot of comic books um, okay yeah. graphic novels and stuff like that because i really like the visual aspect too um so i always did but the truth now unfortunately is uh, in the past 12 years i've not read one single novel for my own sake because i just can't read <laughs> yeah you're probably reading uh, 10 times as much as much but it's a di <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 60 60 books a year or so you know give or take and uh one a week pretty much so uh, and it's not just reading them, but performing them. So, but yeah, when I, uh, uh, if something comes along, but I've been really lucky that the stuff that I uh, do is stuff that I would probably be interested in reading uh, if I wasn't performing it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been key to me being successful is uh, I really like the stuff I do. I enjoy, you know, um, 
all these authors I get to work with are people I would read if I wasn't narrating. Mm. So how is it different? Like with, um, you know, you read a book, you sit down, whether it's Kindle or paper and you start reading it. But in your case, you get this project, you're, you're not just reading it. You, I would assume you have some process where you kind of break things apart and dissect. And um, I think a lot of the, open, a lot of the process is, is internalized now because I've been doing it long enough. I had a different process when I started out. I'd say the first four years of narrating where I was doing it as my main job. Um, I would pre-read everything. Uh, it was all on paper at that time. We didn't even have uh, iPads back then. Um, I mean, they were out, but it wasn't something people used. They used mm -hmm. you know, these reams of paper. Um, and so I would read everything and then I would highlight all the characters in different colors. So if it was orange, I know it's the main guy or if it was, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I tried to be non-gender conformative. I remember even back then I'd be like, I'm going to make the main guy pink. Because I think he could like pink. There's no reason. Why would he not be pink? So Somebody's got to be Mr. Pink. I know, I know. So uh, even back then I knew. But so that was for years I did that uh, and make lists of words to look up and um, um, pronunciation lists and, and those kind of things. Uh, but after that, I stopped. Um, and then there's a couple reasons why. One, I shifted over to recording exclusively from home. So the process is different. If I was to record with an engineer and a director, I would want to have it read ahead of time. So they're not, I'm not wasting their time mm. by trying to figure something out in the moment, but because it's just me in here, I can figure it out as I go along. And I've always enjoyed cold reading more than reading ahead. I just enjoy, I get more lost in the story. I'm less thinking about it. I get surprised by things. So now I exclusively cold read uh, everything. Um, but that's not to say that I don't stop and go, okay, who's this character? What's going on? I'll look ahead. Um, I've been very fortunate that a lot of authors I work with continually know this and they give me a character breakdown, um, or some sort of heads up. If it's like, by the way, the killer is actually from Ireland, uh, just so you know, <laughs> and they don't reveal that until the end. So <clears throat> That's it. But I don't encourage that for anybody else. That's my process. And I think most people are served by reading ahead and being prepared in that way. Mm. Um, but the process to narrate is an incredibly personal process. So it's, it's however you find it works is legit. In my opinion, as long as you're owning the story and you're, you know, not forcing things or that kind of thing, it's it, simplify it and make it your own process. That's how I always tell other people, mm. to do it, but don't do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many, um, just kind of on a percentage basis, how many of the books you do of that 60 in a year are books that you're familiar with the series because you've read previous books versus? <laughs> You know, 90%, books that are I'd say <clears throat> probably 90 percent, but not, maybe 75 percent of the books I do are series related. But there's always new series. Like right now I'm recording Orphan Wars um, by Jay and Chaney, and that's a new series in a new universe. But it's an author I've worked with before. Um, so I'm familiar with his writing style. And so it's um, it does. I do take on new stuff, but that does help with the process, too, if I'm in book, you know, 17 of renegade wars or whatever you know th those yeah, are renegade star wars is other and i go back and keep like a you know notes or not notes but like sound clips that i can go back and listen to mm. to refresh what character it is if there's somebody that shows up again or i send in a you know uh and desperate email to richard fox saying who the f is this guy and he's like oh it was from book two like seven years ago and i <laughs> I pull up the script for book two, I find the character in there and then I pull up the waveform and then I can actually hear what I did seven years ago. And invariably I'm like, I don't like that, but well, I gotta do it. <laughs> I'm, damn, I'm stuck with that voice now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, how, how's, so I know for authors, like you, you're always trying to do your best work and you know, the, the book, first books you write, they're the best books you can write. But when you go back, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that people bought this. How do you feel like when you go back and listen to your earlier? I can't. It's awful. It's awful. <laughs> a lot of times I'll have people be like, 
some book that I did 10 years ago might like get re-released or, you know, and they'll still just use the, that narration. And I, I, I feel like we're constantly um, growing and changing and my narration style from week to week, I hope is getting better. Mm -hmm. So um, there's always ways to improve. So that means that there may be stuff that I did before that I just don't like it. I rushed, you know what I mean? It was also like kind of high pitched and very kind of monotone a lot of ways. And um, yeah, I, I hate it. I can't listen to that stuff. No, <laughs> I did. It. I tried. I tried really hard, but you just learn. I mean, it's like anything after 10 years, you're going to be better at it. Well, right, right. Like, hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> right? Like, Otherwise, <laughs> don't quit your day job. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, like I say to a lot of authors, it's like, you better hope your first book isn't your best book, right? Like, right. Yeah, um, you don't want to peak. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's really bad if it is an awesome book and then you're trying to capture, capture that lightning again. Like, those are the authors that really have a hard career. But if you're always getting better and better, then yeah, it, it, it makes for, makes for bad times when you go back and look at those first books. Right. right. But then it shows your progress. So you can yeah. look at it both ways, you know? Yeah. Um, so kind of from the, from the narrator perspective, if I was like a new narrator getting into this, what would you be, you know, uh, guiding them about? I know a lot of, so I've been on clubhouse and I hear a lot of people on there. Like, I want to be a narrator. I want to come for voiceover to, to doing audiobooks and it's like i don't think it's that easy like no it's hard i think <clears throat> it's like anything though if you want it and you work hard you can get it so it's not impossible but not everybody i think knows that they may not actually want it it may sound good but it the the old old adage is if you want an audiobook narrator take a book sit in your closet and read for 2 hours out loud and then when you come out of the boot or the closet, if you still mm -hmm. want to be an audiobook narrator, then you take the next steps. But you uh, have to first realize, can I sit quietly for more than an hour at a time? Um, now, I tend to, now that I do this, I don't stay in the booth longer than an hour. PSA, uh, carbon monoxide levels in small rooms. So all you authors with your little shed where you're writing and you think you're doing great, good for you, but make sure it has ventilation because at... Uh, uh, most places we are inside is 600, uh, a level of 600, which is almost too high. 700, you lose 20% of your cognition. Um, and anything over that, you're just like running your head against the wall. So always make sure you've got good ventilation. That's my PSA. Because I found out I didn't, and I've been doing it for years that way. And I feel like I probably <laughs> burned off more brain cells than college. So I, <laughs> yeah, I, it's like... I, I definitely always put that out there. Yeah. Make sure your CO2 levels are okay. Cause That's and I think crazy. people don't realize that you're sitting in a small room and even in offices have problems and stuff like that. And there's things you can do fans and stuff to get, but uh, I got this CO2 reader that uh, will tell me what the, the levels are. And it's scary. Um, especially when you're talking and you're in a, well, yeah, you're space. expending so much, right? So you're right, the problem. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. So, yeah. So, um, I don't know how we got off on that tangent, but, uh, but <laughs> that's what we do here. <laughs> yeah, no, it was important. I'm like all these, because I know everyone now working from home is trying to find whatever space they can. And uh, I didn't think about it. So nobody else is thinking about the fact that they've got, you know, in the closet with all those clothes hanging over you and you're breathing for an hour. Oh. So yes, if you want to get into it though, back to that, that's how we got there. Um, see if you even can sit still it's really hard. Imagine sitting still for an hour because you can't make any sounds or it comes through. Um, so it's just sitting still. The clothes you wear, everything about it is uh, very particular. Um, mm. This is good narrating because it's soft material. So there's nothing that would click. Obviously you couldn't wear a hat, but that's style. So uh, <laughs> as soon as you said this was a video call, I was like, let's put the hat on. Um, <laughs> and I'll look stylish and cool. And then I think listening is super important. Listen to stuff. Other narrators listen to audiobooks. What do you like? What what narrator makes something you're like, oh, I like how he does it. Why do I like how oh, I like his pace or I like his characters or I like her inflection or I like her tone of voice or anything like that? Just learn about it any way you can. So, like you said, going on Discord or what any of these places where people talk about it, going into groups um, and learning about it. 
getting coaching is really good. I was lucky because I had um, actor training, which has served mm. me so, so, so well, um, even just in learning how to sit still and not make noise. Um, that's like the physical training we did. So learning from other people. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I've had people reach out to me that's like, I, I'm starting out. I really like your narration. Can we talk for a little bit? I always offer money. Um, most people don't have time to do that for free. That's a big deal. And a lot of people use that as their source of income. So always be courteous and, and offer money for that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be a lot, you know, it, unless they haven't established coaching business, then just mm -hmm. follow the rules there. But it's okay to reach out to people, but be cautious of their time and their attention and don't get hurt if they don't write back. Um, and then as far as actually doing it, you've got to learn all about the equipment, uh, how to run the programs, um, you know, and there is great tutorials anywhere like uh, ACX is a great place to start. I always mm. refer them over. I do work on their site. Um, you have to be careful what you get because you may not be making any money, but if you do it right, you can. Um, but it is a good way to learn about it. They have tutorials in this thing called ACX University, so ACX.com. And they have lots of tutorials about the stuff. So she can learn the basics of like, what even do you need? You, you know, a compressor and a, uh, some sort of outside computer and what kind of space is it for the microphone? You know, there's just a lot to learn. So learn as much as you can by researching and, and following that thread. And that usually will lead you to places. Um, once you get a demo or something like that, you can try to look up, you know, producers or publishers. A lot of places won't take unsolicited. Uh, stuff. So you've kind of got to find different avenues. It takes a lot of work, but I think if somebody wants it, there's a lot of opportunity in this. Um, mm. They have to just actually want it because you may get in there and go, eh, it's not really for me. Um, you know, maybe I like getting the rights to something and then publishing it or being behind the scenes. There's a lot of different ways. Uh, maybe I'm better at the um, engineering part. I really like the computer aspect, but not that you might find that as you start to get into it and that's okay. Follow the thread that you're, you know, that you're on and be available to any opportunity that comes along open to it. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. I, if, you know, it's, it's kind of looking at the, you know, the analogy in the author world, I think what, um, with the opportunities that's come from independent publishing, folks have gotten into it. And when they've had successes, they're, they're really bummed out about like all the other stuff that you have to do. It's like, they like the fact that they can make more money and that they have the opportunity, but it's like, oh, but I got to market. I got to stay on top of this. I got to, you know, I got to go find editors. I got to manage this. I got to do, right. And it's like, well, yeah, that's the, the publishing part, right? That was what those other guys were getting paid for. So right. if right. you are going to be you, like you, I mean, you're running this whole, I don't know how much you, I'm sure you outsource things like engineering and all of it. Yeah. Every yeah. post, all post goes out. I don't do any of that, Yeah, but I think to learn, you know, you can, but it's also about uh, time. How much time are you putting into something? Yeah. And uh, uh, your time is worth money. You have yeah. to decide how much is my time worth? Well, and even so, you, even though you, you, you don't do that work, you have to make sure that you're wrangling those people, right? Like you have to schedule right. that stuff and they're at, you know, right. and yeah. You know, I know from an author perspective, um, you know, it's more and more important to have simultaneous release, right? So ebook, audiobook, print. Okay, well, now they have to coordinate with your schedule. Right. That's not easy. <laughs> right? That's not easy. And a lot of mine, I, I'm, I'm always feeling that pressure of I see the book comes out and I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to record that, but not for like three more weeks. Oh, well, shit, I tried. <laughs> it's tough to get that simul, uh, simultaneous release, but uh, when it does happen, it's exciting. And when it doesn't, it works out. But um, I think just the move towards um, kind of embracing the audio form as much as any of the print forms as a um, kind of as the package that you want for when you put your book out. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like a uh, movie deal is the the dream down the road. But for now, the main things you want is to have it out so people can read it and listen to it. And I think those are the two. They kind of get married hand in hand now, but that didn't used to be the case. Oh, for sure. And, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit beforehand and you mentioned, you know, like Jay and Chaney or Coda Crowd mm -hmm. or 
Chris mm-hmm. Kenny or Jason Onspach, these guys that are in certain genres, what we've discovered is that there's far more interest when it's narrated. Those guys quit mm-hmm. reading books back and, and probably didn't even read them in high school, right? They just got the clip notes. <laughs> Well, and they're saying the the demographic is of uh, age is going down too. So a lot of younger people are listening, whereas uh, predominantly when it started out, it was a bit of an older crowd. Um, uh, but now you've got a lot of gamers and people that are listening. Mm-hmm. This whole um, lit RPG world of the last three years has just blown up. And uh, Isn't that crazy to be a part. It's crazy. I remember getting the first one and being like, what is this? <laughs> like, it just blew my mind. And I was never a gamer, um, uh, but I've had to learn about it through doing the books. And I have such an appreciation for it now because I get that. I never really got the the structure of games and how, like the getting gaining points and rewards and bettering yourself like it's very much like almost a philosophical Mm -hmm. structure to these things that's very deeply rooted in personal betterment and friends and community and like oh yeah it's so funny uh to me it's i've i've totally gotten a new appreciation for the quote-unquote gamer through these things because they're deep and they have a lot of uh, uh fun humor but they also have a lot of you know uh, really cool ways of thinking about things, breaking stuff down into its basic basic elements, and um, it's an exciting thing to be a part of something like that. I'm I'm really glad that I get to do those books. Yeah, and, and I know from you know my clients that are in that space that it's it's not just writing either. It's like you have to have a game system that underlies this whole story world, and it has to be legit because guess right. what, your readers. They they're on top of this stuff, and they'll be like, "Ah, eh, that's not, you said back in book two, the experience points were twenty three, and what happened?" Right. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, the guys like Dakota Crowd and all these, um, uh, you know, it, 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 their minds work in a different way. That's very interesting, mm-hmm. and it does set itself up well for world building and storytelling. So it is actually a. Um, logical transition that now there's this whole literary genre based around it because the whole point of video games is a story and developing characters Mm -hmm. which is the exact same thing that uh, a book is so they actually cross really well and it's surprising no one's thought about it until now but uh, but man uh, it's cool to see the development too and how different authors handle it and uh, they all have their own flair um, so, and I, and they, that's how I think they find that success is they have a very sp- brand, like, you know, Dakota Kraut, mm-hmm. like his brand is very much his, his style, his voice is his, um, all these others too do the same thing. And they're all different in their own way, finding something that speaks to them, I think, which is why it comes across to us. Um, oh, so yeah. it's finding that, that, that niche that you like and bringing that forward and illuminating it. So other people go, I like that too, you know? Well, you know, one of the things that um, I've talked about a lot with my clients and, you know, I, I, I wrote a book on this is that what, when people wonder why somebody like that takes off any of the authors we may have mentioned, it's, there's this whole piece that we forget about that one is um, there's, a piece of your identity that gets attached to that, right? When you have that character that's living in your head and Mm -hmm. you're associating with them, that becomes part of your identity. And then when you find that there's a community around that, that Mm -hmm. you can be a part of, Mm -hmm. then it just grows in in a really organic way that you can't force with advertising or any of that stuff. And it's like, you go back in time, it's like, if you, if you and I walked into a big five publishing company and said, Hey, we think we should be, you know, really getting into this gaming, writing books about guys that are stuck in games. They, they would have fired us. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. But, no. but the, but how is it that, that, that this developed is because folks that were in that world that were gamers and loved all that stuff had to write those stories, right? Like, and then right. they found their community and that tribe has just grown and grown and grown. Yeah. Yeah. And I think anything like that, that's um, there's more and more desire for crossover. So you, we want to see our comics made into movies and we want to see our 
books made into audio books and then we can all kind of come together and there's like an inclusivity in the fact that it's all these that you may be really into gaming and audio and it's like oh my god i found the perfect match you know it's 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 you never know what's going to hit with people but if it hits with you more than likely there's other people out there that uh, will have a similar experience you can share that with oh yeah and i you know i, I see that's where things are going right I, Talk, that's where we want to go, right? We're talking about like, okay, now we need to get those guys that can do the animations, right? Right. So, so like eventually so that's going to, that's going to be your thing, right? Is like, well, got to get Luke Daniels to be the voice in this, this, this cartoon we're going to do. <laughs> I, I still haven't seen what it could be. And, uh, but if somebody smarter than me can figure it out, I think they should. There is some sort of marrying between audiobook narration and uh, some sort of visual cartoon type thing. I just, there's so much, it, especially cartoon. I don't know why it lends so well to that. Um, I had an author, Hunter Blaine, does a series, The Preternatural Chronicles, and he had somebody just as a laugh uh, an a animate, you know, a, a few pages of text that I'd narrated. Mm -hmm. with two characters talking and then the narration in between. Um, and it was done very simple, like kind of South Park style graphics. I freaking loved it. I got such a kick out of it. And I felt like some of these authors that have a lot of like action or um, um, dialogue, those kind of things would lend really well to that. Um, and we don't need fancy, you know, Disney style graphics, just something mm -hmm. to go along with it. So I, I, I bet in the next couple of years, we'll see a lot more of that where people are oh, yeah. marrying some sort of graphic element. It's closer than you think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, I'll, we'll, after we're off, I'll share some stuff with yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I find um, that really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. It just opens uh, it up again. You know, it's yeah. just another way to do it. Well, I, I really believe we're in this golden age of content creation and that the folks that we're talking about are being creating these iconic brands that yeah. people are going to be referencing like Star Wars and Marvel. It's, it's yeah. going to happen. Um, yeah. And especially knowing that we're of that generation that's grown up with that pop culture, right? It's just kind of self-perpetuating. Uh, you know, you mentioned, mentioned Hunter Blaine or Shane Silvers that use all that iconography in their own books, right? Like half of the book is that Deadpool is kind of, yeah. humor right breaking the fourth wall and there's a lot in the audiobooks that you know hunter does that all the time where he's you know kind of referencing that this is a book but it's not because he's got a first person narrative which is it's a it's a balancing act it's but i i applaud him for doing that because not a lot of people do you know acknowledge that there's people listening right now and yeah. it's that breaking the fourth wall that can be kind of fun but i see that crossover again Everything is kind of, you know what I mean? And it's that inclusivity. Bring them all in. Uh, have people that like the same things be able to share them. Mm, for sure. So we're kind of on this topic, but how do you see the industry and maybe more from like your side of the, the business, the narration side? How do you see kind of the future and where things might be in the next few years? Well, I hope it continues on the trend it's had because the past 10 years have just been insane to see the popularity of audiobooks just jump, jump, jump. So I always wonder, is there a, you know, is there a plateau? Um, because I haven't seen that yet. And the, in the whole time I've been here, it's just been one year after another is getting more and bigger and bigger. So I think you're going to continue to see those trends. Um, A-list celebrities narrating A-list books. We're going to see that. Con it's, it's, it's almost like it's become a status thing now. Mm. And the people that are doing the narrating, it's almost like they have, it, it's funny to see that, that they're, uh, you know, Tom Hanks is narrating or, you know, it's not an easy job. So they must want to do it. And you're like, you don't have to do this kind of stuff, but to see these names do that. So I think you'll see more of that, which I think it's a good thing. Everybody kind of kvetches about the fact that, that they are, but anything that legitimizes and raises the bar is yeah. good so i have no problem with it um and i think there'll be more of that collaboration um uh, where it's author narrator relationships that they continue so like dakota and i have a ongoing relationship mm -hmm. where we'll be working together for the foreseeable future i think you'll see a lot of that where they'll kind of authors will find the narrator that 
works for their fans and try to hold on to that. So again, that's the same trend now, but more of that where it's, it, people don't want to switch uh, people through a series and then they want to see the author and the narrator have a relationship, either mm-hmm. whether it's through social media or, or podcasts or that kind of stuff. They like to see that relationship of, of those two people, which is interesting. I think you'll see a lot more narrators writing their own material. Um, I did a book last year and I've seen a few other narrators who have broken into writing from narrating. I think you'll see mm-hmm. crossover crossover in that way. Um, and I think you'll see a, an elevation of the narrator as kind of a uh, celebrity type thing. Um, I do think that can, can grow, especially if the business expands to incorporate other things like uh, uh, cartoon or mm-hmm. um, author interaction and that kind of thing. And then as hopefully things go back to normal, more conventions, I think you'll see a surge if things go back where there'll be huge conventions with blowout numbers because everybody's itching to be able to oh, yeah. connect. <laughs> sure. It's going to be in the, like, I'm literally just like, I just want to buy stocks because as soon as this thing goes away, the, everything's going to go crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I, I think that again, uh, independent, um, authors uh, will kind of drive uh, trends as opposed to uh, big uh, five publishers. I think some of these independent um, authors, like we've mentioned, um, have really shown how um, important they are to this medium. And um, and it will get even more so. I don't think that's going to go away. I think it's going to be more uh, less kind of monopoly top guys and more spread out on the bottom. I hope. Oh well, yeah. I, I think that um, when you look at what's happened in the industry um, there, there's just something that you have when you've grown up in that world that mm-hmm. you see that you can connect better with the fan when you're, when you're trying to look at this from a, and I've got nothing against big corporations, but when yeah. they they've got they're too far away from the fan, and 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 that's like everyone forgets like where does all this money come from? It's some yeah. dude is prepared to pay money to listen to you read a book to them, right? Right, right. Everything right. else and, in between there's kind of friction, right? And 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 then they want to expand that experience if they like hearing that book, they want to know more about it. I mean, that's the big thing I see that's different because there's accessibility now to authors and narrators and um, people want more information. I feel like they did before, but there was no way to get it. Now they can find, who is this guy? And they go look him up or who is this uh, woman? They go look him up and then they form a relationship with the person and not just the product. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes it more personal and makes people kind of lifelong fans when you're able to do that. And uh, that's just so good for them and for you. Sure. And there's that you know, symbiotic relationship that you, you start to develop because, you know, the, the author also understands like when Luke or R.C. Bray or some other, you know, narrator reads my books, things go better in my business. Right. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. And it's all genre specific. Right. Like you probably are, I don't what are the main genres you're 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 doing narration in now? Uh sci-fi fantasy um lit rpg um that's urban fantasy regular fantasy sci-fi military Mm sci-fi um uh lit rpg um most of it's all that pretty much yeah and and then you have on the you know there's other people that are like they're well-known authors in romance right yeah um oh romance is huge that's the other thing romance is huge and uh and they have like some of the most diehard fans and they're very, it feels like a very inclusive and good community. Most of the reading people that read tend to be decent people. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I don't know why, but uh, I've had great fortune with the people that listen to the books I've done have been so kind. And like, there's not a lot of that s- stuff that, you know, trolling and that kind of thing that I see, I'm sure other people get it, but but they, it does tend to be kind of an elevated, I think they're intelligent. People that read are just naturally intelligent. Mm. So I like having that as kind of, yeah, um, the fans are really cool. Yeah, really cool. 
Awesome. Um, so kind of as we kind of wrap up here, it, for authors that are thinking about narration uh, as kind of the next step, and, I'm, you know, one of my big things is, is that, um, you know, if you're an author and you've got a couple books out, you should really look at getting your book into audiobook. You can do things like run Kickstarters to fund these things. Um, there's yep. different ways to get the funding to do it other than, than, you know, kind of the royalty split model. But a couple questions around that. One is, um, like, what do you think, after observing the, the stories that come over the wall to you, like, mm -hmm. what do you see are the things that really kind of make for a great story as a narrated story? Like, what could you help an author to think about, whether it's dialogue or, you know, um, I think, uh, uh, dialogue <laughs> to jump on <laughs> yours. Um, everyone loves fun, uh, fast paced dialogue, not easy to write. Um, but in audio form, I find it incredibly engaging to perform. And if I'm listening, I like to listen that way. Um, if you are doing it, uh, with audio in mind, it can sometimes help to clean up some of the he said, she saids and not have to use as many. And I think that can actually help with your writing as well, because maybe you put them in there, but you don't necessarily need it. Um, it's real tough uh, sentence structure. Um, some things are easily read and not easily said. Um, so you may have these long sentences and that may work if it's a lyrical type novel, but um it can become a bit run on or when you're listening, you get that monot that monotone or you kind of stop, you, you know, so, so I think um, focusing on simpler is always better mm. um, in, in my opinion and not trying to be too clever. Um, and I think action and character is a big deal. People never, I, I always, it's interests me when they um, I've noticed authors add more description over time. Whereas when I first started reading their books, it, they may and didn't go into it as much. And after they've, they've had some audiobooks, they'll start to leave more indicators. Uh, like in book three, it'll say, then Hans walked in. He was a gruff man in his 30s and had a grizzled voice. <laughs> da, da, da. They're like, here you go. Here you go. I'd like you to, to do that. Whereas before, I don't think they think about it. But if you have a real clear vision, uh, it helps to spell that out, uh, not just for the narrator, but for the, the reader or listener, too. Um, some I can tell some authors don't like um, doing that, and that's totally legit, too. But you're just opening it up to whatever the interpretation of the uh, narrator or the reader is, which mm -hmm. is fine. Um, but the, if you want a specific vision, you've got to put it in there for the narrator to pick up on. Um, I think having a conversation with the narrator ahead, ahead of time we're always open to that. We'd sit there and do stuff in our box by ourselves. And I, I think that maybe authors might be worried about being a pain or whatever, but any input is good input in my mind. So if an author tells me stuff, that's like gold mm -hmm. um, that I can, I can use. It doesn't inhibit me in any way. So communication and asking for what you want, you know, and not being afraid to say, I really don't want really broad characters. I would like to hear this this way. Or you may say, you know, I, I want this guy to sound like I have this all the time where they give um, actors or something. But the best ones are the way they, they're like, it's Joey from the such and such scene of the third like anime <laughs> movie. And like and then they'll give me the like they'll actually give me the thing. And uh, I watch it. I'm like, how did you find this guy? You know, or I, uh, <laughs> but it's all helpful. It's all helpful. And then I think just it, authors should probably listen to some audiobooks. And again, like a narrator, what just like what I would read and say, what you know, what interests me, they should listen and go, Oh, I hate it when narrators do this, or I really like a female narrator when I, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you, yeah. Ha you have to have some awareness of the medium itself uh, to have an understanding. So, it would take you, you know, just picking out a couple things and taking a listen and see what, what works for you mm -hmm. and then try to incorporate that. Um, but then it's all story and character. So really you don't want to think too much about, uh, the media because that, that could affect how you're writing it. It's really story and character. Those things are make an audiobook pop for sure. Well, I, I've, I've observed changes in how authors write once they start, um, doing mm -hmm. audiobooks. And I, what I think a lot of it is, it's that they finally get this 
uh, view into their reader's mind, right? They, mm-hmm. Because when they're reading it, even if they do read it out loud, like they're filling in all those blanks and like, because they knew what that story was meant, but all of a sudden you get this new perspective of somebody else reading it with, you know, sure they have their professional experience, but they don't have the, that maybe that whole story world experience and they hear it and they're like, Oh, there are some things here that I should be less specific about. And here's some things I should be more specific about. Right. Right. Right, right. And I think that specificity is is a really good thing for any of us in my work, in an author's work, finding those specific things and always kind of narrowing it down. I always think about it like a table metaphor where you first describe there's a table, okay? There's a table made of hardwood. There's a table made of gray hardwood. You know what I mean? And it, yeah. you can keep going deeper and deeper into that little pin drop uh, all the way until you're in the grain of the, the wood and um, how far do you need to go to tell the story before mm. you're just padding everything? And uh, that's the other big thing. Um, I feel like any sort of padding an author may do just to kind of bump up their word count is way more noticeable in audio than in reading. Our eye kind of skips over stuff. I'm not talking about like random added words, but when they maybe kind of go on about something a little too yeah. long, yeah. Um, it really comes out in audio and in reading. I think it's easier just to kind of go with the flow that way. Mm. Yeah, that's for sure. I, you know, and I think like, um, you know, you can see when an author is first getting started and they feel they have to do all that exposition mm-hmm. and then, you know, the reality is, is that if you're going to be doing this for a long time and you're writing a series, you shouldn't be doing all that exposition. That could be four books, right? Like, <laughs> Right. You can use it. You can use, use it. it but yeah. I do think there's a big uh, difference, too, um, in first person narration, third person narration with audiobooks. I personally tend to like first person. Um, I feel like I can get you get a big sense of the character and you get to play it. I always make less mistakes when it's first person narration Hmm. than when I'm performing third person narration, because third person, you're constantly trying not to sound like an announcer or this omniscient kind of person and be intimate and telling the story. And I find that easier if I'm playing a character than if I'm just the voice of God, so to speak. Right. Um, But that doesn't really, you know, your story may need to be told that way. There are stories that have to be told that way. That's just a little weird, um, you know. Yeah, some genres you have to, you know, there's kind of already, uh, like when you talk about urban fantasy, like if you weren't to write in first person, you're setting yourself up for kind of failure. (laughs) It's it's interesting how much it lends to that, that, that urban fantasy but I don't think it would be good for lit RPG because you need to see this whole world. Yeah. I mean, you can, but it, it I, and I think it could be effective both ways, but um, yeah, the, there's certain structures that are there for a reason, I think. Mm-hmm. Or like romance where you, you know, it's, it's a kind of, some of them are expected to be like boy chapter, girl chapter back and forth. Right. Like yep. you, you yep. have this, but then you've got to get two narrators, um, which is going to be more difficult. Um, mm. um, so, yeah, there's all sorts of things you don't think about. If your main character is an African-American, you need to try to find an African-American uh, um, to do it. You know, yeah. it's just that's just the way it is now. Um, and that's good. So I think you have to think about those things ahead of time. though. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I know. Um you probably open up some of these books and you're like, Oh my God, there's like all these different characters and dialect. And <laughs> I don't mind that. I actually like that. It keeps yeah. it interesting. I get, oh, I just, good. that's the stuff that I like. And so it, while at times it can be kind of scary because you're like, how am I going to do this? Um, you know, it, it keeps it interesting. It just, mm. there's, there's, there's always a way to do it. There's always a way to do it. You just have to kind of be open to the story and, and tell it tell the story. Yeah, that's it. Awesome, Luke. Well, it's been great to have you on the show and I really appreciate the time that uh, you're taking away um, from some folks that we know not getting their books narrated. (laughs) I know. I I, will we'll tell uh, Mr. Cheney that I I needed to take this break, but uh, I'm sure he's like, because Orphan Wars already came out, I'm pretty sure. So he's like, oh yeah, it's been out. I I think he's, 
I actually, I've got a, I'm actually talking to him this afternoon. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell him that we, yeah. we talk. Tell him they, tell him, tell him they told me it was 10 hours. That this book is longer than 10 hours. I'll tell you that much. It's okay. good. It's really good. I think, um, it's the classic Cheney um, action and character and humor, but I love the new setting. I think it's cool to have a change after doing the Renegade series for several years. Um, and it came to such a great ending uh, that uh, it's really fun to start something new with him. So yeah, I'm, I'm, real, I'm real lucky and excited about it. So it'll well, get done, Mr. Cheney. Yeah. We've been talking about, he's, he's really excited and that book out it's doing well. So um, Good. is that the one he co-wrote with Scott Moon? I think this is the Scott Moon one. He does yeah. a few of those. Um, I have to look at the actual the Reaper book. series was with him. So um, yeah, there's, you know, it's it, it's, it, and I don't know what else you're doing with him, but like, you know, there's been a lot of those big epic series that have wrapped up and like these new ones are starting. So um, it's a good time think, to be in the books. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be I think that series is going to be similar to 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 Renegade Star. It's going to go for a while and be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a few of them scheduled and I've got uh, a couple other things I'm working on with him through Podium, which is uh, uh, the publisher. I I really like them. They're great. So I'll give them mm -hmm. my voice of approval on this, but um, it's been fun to get to do them. Uh, their stuff is real action and great. Yeah. They're um, they're, they got a nice, they, they know how to pick good books. They do. They work. On the and they do books. a little more work marketing and getting them. I think they put a little more money in to make things look good and slick and uh, it, it pays. It just looks really good. So mm. cool. And good people too. So always yeah. good to work with good people. All well, right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we'll we'll keep you in mind. We'll make sure we check in again as uh, time goes on and see how this industry progresses. I know this year for me, you know, I'm focusing on talking to a lot of folks like you and authors that are really pushing audiobooks because I believe this is going to be probably the lion's share of, you know, this the content that they're they're making money off of. So. And it's an exciting time. There's a lot of possibility. Like you said, it's the, the, it's the wild West, whatever, you know, there's whatever you can think of, mm -hmm. you can take it there. So I uh, appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to talking to you again. All right. Thanks Luke. Okay. Take care.